Horror films were badly disrespected before The Exorcist, but that's only fair, because horrors of that film's depth and quality were very rare gems scattered across the decades before it, and even then they rarely troubled the award ceremonies of their day. But things were about to change, and it was all down to a writer who was best known for his comedy films, such as The Pink Panther's A Shot in the Dark. That writer was William Peter Blatty, who would also pen the screenplay based on his best-selling novel and produce the film adaptation. After a gruelling and disaster-prone shooting schedule, The Exorcist was released on 26th of December 1973 to an expectant America that had devoured the novel and kept it on the New York Times bestseller list for 57 weeks. It would soon become clear, though, that The Exorcist would be more than just another movie release. It would become a global news event. I went to check it out. The manager of the National Theatre in Westwood says that there indeed are at least a dozen people who faint or become ill during every showing. But The Exorcist is still drawing sellout houses for every performance, complete with lines around the block. Audience members would suffer all kinds of extreme reactions to the film. Seizures, vomiting, fainting, or just being so damn scared that they had to stop watching the film and escape to the lobby. This is the second time we've seen it. We still can't hack it. No. Why? I'm not going back in there. I was only eight years old back then, and far more interested in toys and comics than the commotion caused by a film I wasn't even old enough to see. But The Exorcist and I were destined to meet in the next decade, courtesy of the home video boom that would bewitch my home country of Britain more than any other. Video cassettes were quickly replacing the limited and expensive Super 8 reels that dominated the 1970s, and for the first time, people could affordably rent or buy their favourite films for viewing in their own homes. This newfound freedom would worry politicians and the media more and more as the decade progressed, and the knives were soon out for what the media campaigner Mary Whitehouse and then the tabloids would label video nasties. You have been warned is the message to video retailers from the Director of Public Prosecutions. If you stock any of the 62 titles on a list circulated by Scotland Yard, you could end up in court. Indirectly linked to that list of schlock horrors, though not officially a part of it, the Exorcist would become a victim of incoming laws that were designed to control the sale and rental of horror videos in particular, and Warner Studios voluntarily removed the film from the UK's booming video market. But I'd already seen the film a few years before, at the age of 16 in 1981, and I spent the next few weeks wishing that I hadn't. In truth, there was little to trouble me in the film's first hour, though the graphic desecration of the Virgin Mary statue was a worrying shot across my bow. Most of that first half focused on the development of the characters, detailing their everyday lives and concerns, while cleverly accelerating the decline of Regan into her possessed state. I didn't realise at the time that this purposeful development was making the characters more real to me and would make the horror all the more real when it finally came. And come it did, in the form of the crucifix masturbation scene. The graphic actions and explicit language in that scene broke me, just as it has broken so many others over the years. It's the pivotal moment when you ask, does it get any worse than this? What I wanted was to get up and walk away, just like the cinema goers back in 1973. The other night this guy came out and I looked out the door and he was lying on the floor. He's really big, he wouldn't have expected, I know. All these big guys, they, they come out and they look like they're ghosts or something. Petrified that things would get even worse after the crucifix scene, my relief was palpable when the exorcist himself, Lancaster Merrin, finally showed up at the possessed girl's house. At last, we had some capable help. We had an experienced priest who knew what had to be done and how to do it. To me, he was the hero sheriff riding into town to put the bad guy in his place. It wasn't only what I was seeing in the exorcist that was disturbing me, though. It was the frequent, sudden, loud... noises. Whether I liked it or not, and I didn't, that climactic exorcism scene was coming, so I braced myself for impact. The chaos in that ice-cold bedroom echoed my own shattered inner state. Amen. The room was shaking, splitting, and cracking, just like me deep down inside. I remember days later, being home alone and placing a chair against the bedroom door, lest that door should slowly creak open and that demon girl would be standing there. The film haunted me that way for weeks, and it would be months before I was properly free from the dark shadow of The Exorcist. I sometimes ask myself, if I'd been watching the film alone, would I have stopped watching it after the crucifix scene? The answer is always yes, 
and I don't believe that I would have watched the film again on my own. William Peter Blatty himself was the recipient of the film's second Oscar for his excellent screenplay, and I'll leave the final words on The Exorcist to him. The film delivers to this very day that very precious commodity, a powerful emotional response. Well, whether it's positive or negative, it doesn't matter. You've been watching episode one of a series on satanic horror films that will include The Omen, Angel Heart, The Devil Rides Out, and Sleepy Hollow.